Okay? Yes? No? No? Not on? Am I on? Okay, so unlike uh, Pastor JP and Pastor Tad, I'm not a preacher, I'm a teacher. Right? And so teachers like to always start with a quiz, pop quiz, right? That's what we like. It's going to be fairly simple, so don't worry. The first question, the pop quiz, the first question, what is the last name of Jesus? He has a last name, in case you are wondering. You don't find it probably not anywhere written in the Bible, but if you were to guess, what's the last name of Jesus? Bar Joseph, very good. <clears throat> if his last name is Bar Joseph, then why do we use the word Christ? Jesus Christ, Jesus the Christ. What is the significance of the word Christ? Any, any ideas? What does the word Christ mean? Okay, let's start there. Okay, it means anointed, that's right. But do you know why he is called the Christ, anointed? It's a title, it's not his last name, unlike maybe we are used to seeing a first name, last name, and sometimes it gets confused, people think Christ is his last name. It's not. It's his title. <clears throat> and I will tell you why he is called the Christ. Who, okay, second question, who was anointed in the Old Testament? What type of, what group of people? Not the names. The kings were anointed, absolutely. Prophets, not, we don't see it that frequently, but yeah. And there's one main group that is also anointed. Priests, that's right, absolutely. Okay, there are three groups of people who were anointed, two are explicitly and one somewhat implicitly, right? Uh, the priests and kings were always anointed before they can take their office, whereas the prophets, we often hear of them are being called as the anointed of God because God anoints them, the Spirit anoints them, puts His word upon their lips before they are able to speak. So even the prophets are treated as anointed. However, there's no one individual in all of the Old Testament who held all three offices together. There was no one individual who was prophet, priest, and king. Abraham was not a prophet, priest, or king. Neither did David, nor Solomon, nor anybody else. There's one individual who comes somewhat close, and I will talk about him in a little bit later. But nobody held all three offices together in all of the Old Testament. And if somebody tried, disaster followed. For example, you remember King Saul, who could not wait for prophet, for priest Samuel, and he tried to do things on his own, and disaster followed. Okay, the third question for the day, the last one, I promise you. How many of you know the name Jesus actually occurs in the Old Testament? And if so, in what form does it occur? Joshua, absolutely right. The name Joshua and Jesus are English pronunciations of the Hebrew version, Yeshua, Joshua, and Greek version, Yesu, from which we get the word Jesus. So J Joshua and Jesus are actually the same name. But how does that matter, you ask, and I will tell you. There are three prophetical books that were written after the people came back from the exile, they go away, uh, the southern kingdom is attacked by Babylon, they go away for 70 years, they are here in this land that is not their own, and they come back to the promised land. And then there are three prophetical books that are written, what we call the post-exilic prophets. You have Zechariah, Haggai, and Malachi. Of these three prophetical books, post-exilic prophets, both Zechariah and Haggai talk about this character a priest by the name Joshua. And in Zechariah chapter 3, you have, when you have time, go back and take a look at it. In Zechariah chapter 3, prophet Zechariah is commanded by God to put a crown upon the head of this priest, Joshua. Okay? First time ever, there's one individual who's both a priest and a king. At this point in the history of Israel, history of Judah, history of the nation, they had no kings, so obviously this is not a real position. It was a position, an indication, a pointer forward to Jesus himself, 
who one day will come and will be the prophet, priest, and king. And not just the incident, not just the placing of the crown upon this priest's head, but the name itself, Joshua and Jesus. You see the similarity. You see how interwoven, how interconnected all of the Bible is. And that is why this, this motif of Jesus being prophet, priest, and king, it is not something that we come to only in the New Testament. It is something that runs through all the pages from beginning to the end. And we'll see, we'll see some of those verses. And it is imperative that when we read the Bible, when we read the Old Testament, when we read the New Testament, we see this signpost. Like most signposts, it is not there in every page, every book, all over. But you will see it again and again and again, this motive of Christ being prophet, priest, and king. And this understanding, this uh, view of Christ being prophet, priest, and king is so foundational to our understanding of the Bible and understanding of who Christ is. Walter Elwell, he writes, all the other Christological designations, such as apostle, shepherd, Counselor, intercessor, and the head of the church are all subsumed under one of these three general offices. Any description of Jesus, anything that he did, apostle, the shepherd, all of those titles, they all fall under one of these three categories, prophet, priest, and king. And that is why he is called the Messiah, he is called the anointed, the one with capital A, anointed, because he alone has been anointed as the prophet, priest, and king. This title, Christ, becomes central to all of the New Testament. When, when, when uh, Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? The whole book of Mark revolves around this one question and one answer, that you are the Messiah, you are the anointed, that you are the prophet, priest, and king. Now here is a... Um, $50 word to explain a simple concept. It comes from Latin. This threefold office of Christ, prophet, priest, and king, in Latin it is called munis triplex. Okay? Or triple cure. Triple cure. Reminding us that these three offices of Christ are all needed to redeem, for us to be redeemed from our fallen sinful condition. We needed Jesus to be prophet, priest, and king. This triple cure, this triple office needed for us to be rescued from our pitiful condition. Why does God need him to be a prophet? Why does God need him to be a king? Why does God need him to be a priest? Is it not enough that he is just priest? It was the 17th century, 17th century theologian uh, Heidegger who said, as a prophet, Listen to me. As a prophet, he ousted our ignorance. As a priest, he bore our alienation from God. And as a king, he filled up our impotence to return to God. We needed this triple cure because it is only by taking upon himself all three offices he was able to procure salvation for us. As a prophet, he ousted our ignorance by bringing to us the word of God. For he is the word. As a priest, he bore our alienation from God by satisfying the wrath of God and paying the penalty for our sins, for he is the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. As a king, he filled up our impotence to return to God by continually defending us and sustaining us in the redemption he has won for us, for he is the king above all kings who fights all our battles. We need it this triple office, this triple cure, munis triplex, the threefold office of Christ, prophet, priest, and king, for us to have any hope in life. And because he alone is able to hold these three offices, we call him Jesus the Anointed, Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah. With that introduction, let's talk about Jesus the Prophet. That's all I'm going to focus on today, Jesus the prophet. But before we do that, before we can understand in what way is Jesus the prophet for us, we need to understand how do prophets function, who are they and what do they do. And I will give you three points, three ways in which to look at prophets. Their calling, their calling first, second, their living, 
And third, their leanings. Okay, this is this is the preacher thing to do everything in triplets. Okay? Their calling, their living, and their leanings. First, their calling, prophets and their calling. Now, you, you all know that prophets were anointed to do one thing and one thing alone, which was to preach the word of God, to bring to people the voice of God. James 5.10 says, The prophets spoke in the name of God. They alone were God's voice to the nation at a time when they had no other means of hearing and knowing what God desires of them. Hence comes the common refrain, Thus says the Lord. They did not speak from their own authority. They did not utter the words that they have made up. They spoke what God told them to speak. That is why Amos writes in chapter 3, verse 7, For the Lord God does nothing without revealing His secrets to His servants, the prophets. And they spoke to the nation in the midst of its disobedience and sinfulness. Now, the prophets are called by many titles. They are called as watchmen. They are guarding the spiritual condition of the nation. They are called servants of God, doing and speaking all that their master commanded them to do. They were the messengers of God, the original apostles before any apostles actually appeared, authorized and anointed by the Spirit to proclaim His word. And they were also called the assayer or the tester because they were called to assess or test the spiritual condition of the nation. And they found the nation lacking severely, having utterly failed the test. Often when we think about prophecy, commonly we understand prophecy as telling the future, foreseeing. But in the Bible, that is not the way in which the word prophecy is used. It is foretelling. It is explaining that which the nation should already have known. It is explaining the word of God in the midst of nation's sinfulness, in the midst of nation's disobedience, explaining to the nation the wrath of God that is burning against them because of their sin and their disobedience, because of their neglect of the widow, the orphan, and the alien, and because of their injustice they have done towards one another in their business dealings and other dealings. With that, let's move to the second point, their living. We read of prophet Isaiah, For example, in Isaiah chapter 20, walking around barefoot, wearing only his inner clothing, which to that nation is practically naked. He walked naked among their people. This to proclaim to the nation what God was communicating, that God will crush through Assyria the nations of Egypt and Cush. Now you're wondering, who cares? Why do Israel care about God's judgment against Egypt and Cush? Because the nation was depending upon Egypt and Cush to rescue them from the Assyrian onslaught, the Assyrian judgment, instead of trusting God. And so God, through Isaiah, by making him walk it naked, wearing just his inner clothes, no, no shoes, barefoot, is communicating to the nation that Egypt and Cush will one day be taken like this naked by the Assyrian that don't trust these nations, they will not be able to protect you from Assyria. Only I alone can do this. In fact, God even drafts the children of Isaiah to use them as object lessons to the nation. Isaiah 8.18 Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. Then we read of Prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 27 of, his, um, of the book which he wrote, how God commanded him to fashion a yoke and some straps and, he, and, and some crossbar and he carried this upon his neck all through the city, proclaiming how the nation will one day be in bondage to King, King Nebuchadnezzar. So prophets just didn't proclaim the word, they actually lived out the word of God in front of the people, in real symbols, in real circumstances. I do not have time to tell you about Hosea and his marriage to his unfaithful wife, Gomer. 
how his life became an object lesson demonstrating the faithfulness of God and the unfaithfulness of the nation. Or about Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 4 where he lay prostrate for over 430 days he was prostrate each day representing God's judgment upon the nation. Or in Ezekiel 5 where God actually uses his hair he tells his, uh, Ezekiel to shave off all his hair on his head and his beard and divide them into three portions and uses that as an object lesson to talk about what God will do to, uh, to the people, one third of the people. Now just a few examples. These prophets, they just did not proclaim the word of God. They lived the word of God. Their living was marked by an unhesitating commitment to pay whatever the cost that is demanded of them in order to proclaim the word of God to the people of God. And then lastly, their leanings. Another thing that marked the prophets is their great sensitivity to sin and injustice. The prophet's words were outbursts of violent emotions. His rebuke is harsh and relentless. But if such deep sensitivity to evil, often when we read prophets, they sound hysterical. We look, we read them and they go, just stop. It's just so much. I can't deal with it. Because the prophets never stop. They keep pronouncing judgment upon judgment. And sometimes people have commented how hysterical they were. But what name should be given to the terrible indifference to sin and evil which the prophet cried out against? The prophet is a man who feels fiercely when we see in his words and actions the wrath of God at the sinfulness of man. We, on the other hand, in spite of having witnessed sin both within ourselves and in others, live as though the reality does not exist. We have learned to silence our consciousness and obliterate our memories. To the prophets and to the God whom they represent, no subject is worthy of consideration as the plight of man. God is busy reflecting over the plight of man rather than as contemplating eternal ideas. God's mind is preoccupied with one thing and one thing alone and that is man and his destiny. In the prophet's message, nothing that has bearing upon good and evil is small or trite in the eyes of God. Man is rebellious and full of iniquity and yet so cherished is he that God, the creator of heaven and earth, is saddened when forsaken by him. One thing that's be that becomes very clear as we study the prophets is the dismay that fills the prophets of Israel in the face of sin and delinquency. Abraham Heschel, who wrote a seminal book titled The Prophets, says this, To us, a single act of injustice, cheating in business, exploitation of the poor, is slight. To the prophets, a disaster. To us, injustice is injurious to the welfare of people. To the prophets, it is a death blow to existence. To us, an episode. To them, a catastrophe, a threat to the world. They speak and act as if the sky were about to collapse because Israel has become unfaithful to God. So that is why they come across as strident, as hysterical, because they are dealing with things of utmost importance to God. And they cannot keep quiet. They cannot be silenced. They will not mix their words when they preach and when they speak. Sin is serious. But what was their message? The message of the prophets. It was nothing short of the gospel as we understand it. God is holy and righteous and cannot and will not tolerate sin. However and whatever way it manifests. Whether it manifests in, in idol worship or in the neglect of the widow, or the poor, or the orphans. The nation, if you remember the Old Testament and the laws of the Old Testament, when they farmed their land, they were supposed to farm not to the edges, they were supposed to leave the edges unharvested, so that the poor and the widow and the alien could go after the farmer and have food to eat. 
the law of God that God had instituted for the nation had this great provisions to care for the people who are poor and neglected and the nation forgot their responsibility. A prophet is not impressed by human accomplishments, however lofty and life-changing they may be. Just as God is not impressed by their empty sacrifices and meaningless rituals, because God does not tolerate sin, He calls the nations to repent and live in accordance with that repentance. And if they do not repent of their ways, God's judgment is surely coming. But every prediction of disaster that the prophet brings to the nation is also followed by an exhortation of, or, and a prediction of hope. The prophet is sent to not only chasten but to strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Almost every prophet brings consolation, promise and the hope of reconciliation along with censor and castigation. He begins with a message of doom and he concludes with the message of hope. In all that they preach, in all that the prophets preach, they point to the ultimate person who comes bearing with him the word of hope. And that is none other than Jesus. Jesus, the promise fulfilled. Now the first hint we have in the Bible that this coming prophet comes to us, that Jesus is this coming prophet comes to us from Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 15 that was read to us. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. And then later on in verse 17, or verse 18, he says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I commanded him. This is going to be another prophet similar to Moses, but one far greater than Moses ever was. And the author of Hebrew explains it this way, think of a house and the builder of the house. Who is greater, the house or the builder? And in the same way, Moses is great, uh, Jesus is greater than Moses as the builder of the house is greater than the house itself. There were many prophets that came between Moses and Jesus, but the nation never actually stopped looking for the prophet. For example, if you think back, if you look, look at the history of the nation, Malachi was the last prophet. As I said earlier, he was the last post-exilic prophet to write to the nation, to preach to the nation around 430 BC. So from the time of Malachi and the last prophecy that came from the, word, from the mouth of God to the nation till the coming of Jesus, what we call the intertestamental period, absolute silence. No word from God to the people. 400 years of silence. Yes, the world, history was moving, the world was moving, great things were happening to the nation and outside of the nation, but absolutely no word from God. Josephus, the historian, says there were no prophets that came to the nation during this time. It was a period where God was preparing the nation for the coming of the ultimate prophet, Jesus himself. So what happens when John the Baptist appears on the scene? If you go back and look at the Gospels, they come to him and they want to know, are you the Elijah? Are you the prophet? That was the constant question they asked everybody. Are you the one who's going to come? Are you the prophet? That became the most important question of the day for them. Are you the prophet we have been waiting for? Turn with me to Luke chapter 4 verse 18. Luke chapter 4 verse 18. <clears throat> And it says, and Luke writes, the Spirit of the Lord, and Jesus, okay, this is what happens. Let me set, set up the scene for you. Luke chapter 4, verse 18, while you are turning there. Jesus goes back to his town. He is in the synagogue, as is the practice. They hand him the scroll. Um, generally, it, one of the men would take the scroll, whatever the appointed designated reading for the day was, they would take the scroll, read the passage, and then provide some exposition on what that passage meant. So as was their practice, they hand Jesus the scroll, he, he, uh, the scroll of Isaiah, and he immediately turns to Isaiah 61 and reads the following. 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, after reading a passage, as I said, you are supposed to provide some exposition, you're supposed to provide a message. <clears throat> but Jesus simply rolls back the scroll, hands it back to the attendant, sits down, and all eyes are upon Jesus. And he simply says, Today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, if you go back, take a look at this passage, the people marvel at what Jesus has said. And two lines and two verses later, they are angry at Jesus. So the marvel turns into wrath, and Jesus had to literally walk or run away through the crowd to protect himself. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus stands before these people who are waiting for a, the ultimate prophet to come, and he declares, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. And they do not, and they miss him completely. But not just here. In John chapter 6, when Jesus feeds the multitude of people and as they're gathering up all the food that was left behind, the people start talking. He must be the prophet. When Jesus raised in Luke chapter 7, when Jesus raises the, um, the, the man, the young man who was, who was dead, people once again talk about it. A great prophet has risen amongst, amongst us. Okay, so the nation that was waiting for this prophet, are getting some glimpses of it, but not, all, not completely. And the one last passage, Acts chapter 3, this is a sermon of Peter that he, pro, he, he gives after the healing of the man who was lame from the birth. And Peter stands among the people and he proclaims this message. And he goes back to Deuteronomy chapter 18, the exact same verses that we read. And he talks about how God sent his prophet and you sent him to the cross. You put him to death. Jesus, the promised prophet, the one who fulfilled that great promise that God gave to Deuteronomy and the nation missed him completely. But he is not just another prophet, but he is the ultimate prophet. He is the greater prophet. While Jesus came in the line of prophets, we know that he is far greater than any of them, greater than even Moses himself. John chapter 12, verse 49, it says, For I have not spoken out of my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. So just like the other prophets, Jesus only spoke what his Father told him to speak, what he was commanded to say. Just like the other prophets, even John chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing out of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. So just like the prophets, Jesus was no different in that sense. He spoke what his Father told him to speak. He did what he saw his Father doing. He obeyed his Father completely. But that is where the similarity ends with the Old Testament prophets. Old Testament talks about a time when God will make a new covenant. Uh, I, I, Jeremiah, okay, this is one passage you all should remember because it's easy. Jeremiah 31, 31. Okay? <clears throat> Jeremiah 31, 31, it talks about a time that is coming where God will make a new covenant and God will write His words upon the hearts of men and women through His Spirit. A time of new covenant where through the Spirit of God, His words will be written upon our hearts. And how is this possible? Because Jesus, the incarnate Word of God, comes to reside in the hearts of His people through the Spirit of God. Not only did Jesus speak what His, what his God the Father commanded Him to speak, He became the incarnate Word who comes to reside in our own hearts. In that sense, he is far superior than any prophets that came before. They only spoke. He lived that word in our hearts. 
Similar to the Old Testament prophets, Jesus was willing to spare no price to bring the word of God to people. But again, there is a difference, isn't it? While the Old Testament prophets were willing to do whatever it was necessary, as we already saw, Isaiah walking naked, or or, uh, Ezekiel lying down uh, for 430 days without moving, right? Jesus did far more than any of them, including dying for the privilege of proclaiming God's word. Jesus' sacrifice means so much more to us while the death of the Old Testament prophets, and that, for that matter, the death of Jesus Christ points to the hardness of human hearts and was a great tragedy. It is because of his death, Jesus' death, that we have been set free from the penalty of sin and the punishment of death. Isaiah 53 talks about how he was despised, rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, and upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds we are healed. Yes, Jesus paid a sacrifice just like the Old Testament prophets paid a sacrifice. But his sacrifice brought us healing and rescue from sin and death. Lastly, just like the Old Testament prophets, Jesus had harsh words to say against the religious leaders, calling them whitewashed tombs and pronouncing woe upon them for their hypocrisy and religious burdens they placed upon the other people, which they themselves were not willing to lift. However, he had compassion upon the oppressed. While he never ignored sin, he was always ready to restore those that came to him or were brought to him. He, of all the prophets, he alone could say to those that were brought to him, I forgive you what you have done. I forgive you your sins. No prophet could have said that, but Jesus did. While Jesus did come as a prophet, he is far greater prophet than anyone else because of what he preached and what he fulfilled through his own life and death. He made possible what he urged people to do. He didn't leave them with just instructions, but he was the way, the truth, and the life. But what does it all mean to us at the end? We understand that Jesus is the prophet, is the ultimate fulfillment, of the prophecy from Deuteronomy. He's the greatest prophet who ever lived. What does that all mean to us today? What does it, how does it make a difference? Every time God sent his prophet, he sent him for one reason and one reason alone, because the people needed the word of God. God needed to communicate his word to his people. Jesus' threefold office However, it's not just restricted to his time while he was on the earth. It is something that is still ongoing today. He's still a prophet, priest, and a king. He still exercises his office today, even while he is seated at the right hand of God. His ongoing prophetic ministry then is a reminder that this world still needs the word of God desperately. And how will this world hear his word except through us, his people. Acts chapter 2, if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 2, verses 17 to 18. Acts 2, 17 to 18. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all the flesh, And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men will see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And even on the male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. God will pour out his spirit upon his people so that they may continue the prophetic ministry that God that Jesus did and he's continuing to do. And it is through us that ministry continues. 
As believers, we have an ongoing responsibility to be involved in the prophetic ministry of proclaiming the word of God to a needy world. We have been given the spirit of God to enable us to do this. Therefore, when Jesus tells us, go out into the world, make disciples, teaching them all that I have commanded, and I will be with you. It is God's promise that his presence will go with us as we continue in this prophetic ministry that God, that Jesus has as, as is still engaged in. We are not alone in this. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, therefore, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, therefore we are ambassadors of Christ. Listen to this. We are ambassadors for Christ because God is making his appeal through us. As those engaged in the ministry of God's word, it is not enough that we proclaim the word of God, that, but that we must live in a way that proves the word of God is believable and trustworthy. Because that's what the prophets did, prophets of old, that's what Jesus did. It is not just the words that they preached, their life itself was a message that communicated to the deaf world around them. When you go out to work, when you work in the places wherever you work, do people know you are a Christian because you tell them you are a Christian or because they can see you living out as a Christian? How are we any different in the way we live among our friends, among our colleagues, among our um, family? It is not just enough to say we are Christians, but our lifestyle, our testimony speaks louder than our words. That does not mean we ignore the words, because what we have is a message to communicate. And lastly, what is our attitude towards sin and injustice, whether in the world or in our own families and in our, amongst our friends or even in our own, um, in, in, in ourselves? Are we like the prophets of old? Have we made a compromise where we do not let sin bother us too much? I mean, after all, I am sinful. I continue to sin. What's the big deal? You know, it's okay. One day I will be perfect. And so we compromise with sin. And we live as if sin does not matter. It matters significantly to God. Persistent sin not only erodes confidence in the gospel, persistent sin will keep you away from God. I always, I always imagine our spiritual life like a spiral. As we understand the gospel, as we drive that deep down into our hearts, as we understand what God has done for us and why we needed God to do this for us, on this spiral we are going closer and closer to God. But when sin becomes persistent, when sin becomes ignored, when sin becomes an ordinary thing of life where it does not bother us anymore, on the same spiral we are going downwards and away from God. And we are never still. Either we are going up or we are going down. We are never in one place standing still. We are continually in this journey up or down, up or down. And that determines at the end of the day how effective we are as prophets of God. Where are you on this journey? Are you traveling? Is the gospel making a difference in your life? Are you on this spiral that is taking you closer and closer to God? Are you on a spiral that is taking you further and further away from God? Because sin is just... It, it happens. A prophet of God does not ignore sin. He's, he cannot ignore sin in himself or sin outside of himself. So to conclude, there are three things. As prophets, we are called to do, to proclaim the word of God, not just through our mouth, which is very important, but also through our life. As prophets of God, our life is the testimony that many will see. As prophets of God, we fight against sin in ourselves, sin amongst our friends and our family, and sin in the world outside. We fight against injustice. And sometimes we all, we are in this mode of, what can I do? It's so hard. The problems are so far away. I am just one person. What can I do? I, how can I change anything in this world? I have no power. 
And the moment you say that we forget that we have the greatest weapon that is ever given to mankind, the weapon of prayer. Prayer brings, prayer brought kings and kingdoms down. We know in today's history, the Berlin Wall came down because of prayer. Romania, Ceausescu lost his power because of prayer. Okay? So we fight against, as prophets of God, we fight against injustice. We are not the people who say, oh, I, know, I don't know what to do, I'm too small, I'm too tiny, I can't influence world events. No. Three things. Proclaim the word of God, live the word of God, and fight for the word of God.